Okay, this is Cameron and Jessica Heil, and we are going to talk about Coal Valley and Jessica's story. And I am going to do a quick orientation um, to kind of what this is all about real quickly for context, if anybody hasn't seen any other interviews. So I wrote a blog post, this blog post, um, about a month ago. And in it, I talked about kind of out of the blue, the negative experiences I had at Coal Valley because it was something that I felt like I wanted to say and this is a, this is a perspective that's not really um, represented, I think, and like not you know, publicly available for people or parents that are thinking about putting their kids in Coal Valley. So I wrote this and the reaction was huge. Um, people were messaging me left and right and before a little while we started a support group of people that wanted to share their stories and um and then like we're gonna we're gonna do a documentary now we eventually made this website and we have a joint statement and so this this has become a movement it's called coal valley speaks and um anyway jessica saw all this and 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 is a part of this and she's going to kind of tell us how her point of view so jessica yeah you saw this stuff and and what went through your head I was, well, I, I was at Cole from second grade through my junior year. Um, so I was there for quite a while and I saw that and I realized, I mean, my story isn't as traumatic as so many others that I've seen, but there were things that just was like, oh my gosh, I know where he's coming from and what he's talking about. And I know how a lot of that feels. And yeah. it was really nice to know that I wasn't alone in being a little bit bitter about my education. <laughs> right, totally. Yeah, so it was it was really good to see that I wasn't the only one that felt that way. Cuz did you not have any other friends or people you were still in touch with that kind of were were at Cole Valley also and that I mean, you know, felt this we way? We were like close. We don't like there's people that I've ca caught up with and that I've stayed like we talked that I knew didn't like it. But even like there was a, I think there was a sort of like, we can't really talk about it kind of right. bubble. Like we yeah. can't really discuss it kind of thing. And that thing which we don't the, speak of, yeah. Yeah, the, that, that shall not be named, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so even when we were together, we didn't really discuss our experiences there. Yeah, yeah. So what, so what was like... Uh, what in particular, like out of the blog posts that, you know, you identified with or you were like, whoa, this is different? Probably the, when you mentioned the dress code at yeah. some point, like how you noticed with girls yeah, uh, with the dress code was my biggest thing because I started, I, I'm, you know, fairly big chested and totally beyond my control, totally something I can't do anything about. And I felt that instead of being taught to love who I was and being taught to just embrace that, I was punished and ridiculed for it. And that was like, it was like I had zero control over it. And I was called a stumbling block on a weekly basis. And so many questions would be like, well, if I'm, I mean, I get it, but why are the guys looking? Why are the guys you know, why is it okay for them to look in the first place and they're yeah. not in trouble? So it's like. It was your fault if they like, you know, were having their own issues. Yeah, exactly. I was like, like, and Mr. Carr on an almost weekly basis would tell me to go put on one of those massive Cole Valley shirts. And I'm a modest person by nature. I don't, you know, but because of it, like if I showed this much chest, it was like, nope, they are, you're being a stumbling block to your brothers. You need to go change or call somebody to come bring you a new shirt. Yeah. And I was just like, this is insane. Like, how is this fair to me? Totally. Because it's, it was just ridiculous. Yeah. I can't imagine what that was like. Um, <laughs> and it, it happened like on, on a regular basis, you said like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Did you say weekly? Usually weekly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It got to the point where my mom was even like, cause she was getting so tired of me calling 
that she literally went into his office and was like, you need to just back off a little bit. Like, this is ridiculous. She was getting calls on sometimes more than once a week from me telling her that I needed a new shirt or that I needed a new pair of pants or, and she's like, I, this is insanity. She's a 13 year old girl. Like, you, like when my mom has to intervene, like there's an issue. That's yeah. Like, <laughs> what do you think's behind that? Do you think that's like a, a systemic culture thing or that's like an individual thing? Like, do you think some people like just, get way bothered by that or like that was in compliance with kind of the I think it was yeah I think it was a compliance with the code kind of thing like we want to be good Christians but it was like but me showing a tiny little bit of my chest isn't like you're you're doing the opposite of what you're trying to accomplish by telling me to do these things and by making me feel bad about the body that God gave me you're making me feel bad about it. Exactly. So it was like, you're, you're doing exact opposite <laughs> of what you're wanting. Right. And it was wow. just, yeah. And so even to this day still, I have horrible self-esteem issues. And I honestly bring it back to that because mm-hmm. it also wasn't quiet. Like he would, like there would literally be, I would be in a hallway or be with my friends or in a classroom and he wouldn't just make it a private thing. He would just be like, you need to go change your shirt. Like in front of everybody. So it wasn't even wow. like a personal private thing. It was a- it's like bullying. It was, it was like, and I'm like, oh my God. Like, and just got completely beat red and dying of humiliation. I'm like, you couldn't do this like one-on-one? I Pull me out of class at least. like. Yeah. But no. <laughs> wow. So did it like eventually stop or was it just like constant from then on out? It was really bad in junior high. I remember it being really bad. And then in high school, I think it kind of, because that was after, that was when my mom finally stepped in and was like, you back off. And, and that so did I think it? in high school, yeah. yeah. Chilled after that? Yeah. He kind of, He kind of slowed down after that. And there were a couple of incidences, but it wasn't as, as bad. And in high school, I will say I deserved it in high school because I was exploring and, you know, trying different styles and stuff. So being being a kid, being a teenager, (laughs) but in junior high, it was completely just uncalled for. And junior high is awkward enough. I don't need that. Right. Did any of the other, this was always one person or was this like a, you know, it was teachers. It was Mr. Carr who was the, who is the principal. And then it was a couple of other teachers who, who believed the same things that he did, who was on the same page as him. And so it was him mostly, but, a couple other teachers would do it cool. Hmm. Wow. They were male teachers, by the way. Just throwing that out there. That makes it kind of worse. Right? Which was kind of awkward. I'm like, I don't, I don't, it was never my female teachers. My female teachers never said anything. Yeah. But the male teachers were, you need to go change your shirt. You're being a stumbling block. Wow okay so yeah actually one thing the support group's been talking about a lot is kind of the influence of parents and Mm -hmm. like you know in terms of uh stakeholders and kind of who has the power in coal valley and like what who kind of lets things like changes happen or not happen or like cracks down it's like it seems like the parents have the most power from our discussions but some people would dispute it but do you think like do you think it was really situational based on like parents like your 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 mom stepped in and things kind of cooled off a bit like do you think that's indicative of a bigger kind of thing I think that parents had a lot to do with 
what was going on. Um, because I, like, as far as, I think my mom has always been very involved in my life and she's always been very, I've always been very honest and upfront with her. And so I was blessed enough to have a mom who would come to my rescue, but I watched a lot of kids whose parents didn't come to their rescue and who was so much in agreement with the school and what the school believed and the the building blocks and the foundation of it that they were just like, oh, well, Mr. Carr is automatically right. Or mm. the teachers are automatically right. Or they were just in agreement to it. And kind of, I don't want to say they didn't care about what the, what their kids had to say, but I think that, I think that they were just oblivious to what was, to what was going on because it's a Christian school. Right. So how could these things be happening? You know what I think is the, maybe the worst would be the, maybe one of the worst examples of that would be any of the kind of really bad trauma that people experienced. Like, mm -hmm. Well, like if sexual assault, if that was like not handled appropriately and basically like kind of brushed away. And then if parents took like the side of the kind of victim blaming yep. position that the administration was taking, that would be really, um, I mean, that would be really terrible and bad for mental health, but like, but also the LGBT kids that yeah. where their parents are, you know, backing up this kind of you know and maybe the parents feel that already independently but and I my best friend all the way from second grade to the time I left was LGBT he was I mean obvious and he's been my oh, best you friend knew? Years. yeah and he wow. was he was gay and it was kind of like it was obvious that he was gay so but he had been my best friend for years and I watched him struggle with being bullied and his parents constantly preaching at him and, you know, him being so afraid to come out because, you know, in front of the school or in front of anybody. Yeah. And it was so hard to watch wow. him have to struggle with that for years. Yeah. Did did you two ever talk about kind of what that was like in the rear view mirror and, um, you know, what that kind of did to his outlook on life or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. We, we had a good, we had a discussion when he finally actually came out to me. It was, I was just like, yeah, I, I said, I know it, I'm not shocked. And he was just like, yeah, most people aren't. I haven't, he hadn't told his parents yet. He was terrified to tell his parents. Um, we had graduated, so he never even went there. But he was like, it was horrible. And he was, I was like, he's like I said, he'd been bullied and he'd been ridiculed. And I got bullied by association because I was constantly with them. And it yeah. was just, it was a mess. And his mom was, pretty high in the school she was a teacher and so it was always very hush 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 under wraps kind of thing huh yeah did you kind of have this perspective during school like you knew it was messed up then or it was kind of like yeah this i mean this is these bad things are happening but this is like appropriate because i'm in this world and i believe it all I, I didn't know in school. I mean, it was, I felt it as an annoyance, but it wasn't, I didn't think that, I honestly didn't know that there was anything wrong until I went to Capitol my senior year. I didn't know what I was missing. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know that all of this was horrible. Like we sat down in health class and actually discussed sex. And I was like, what? Whoa what <laughs> like you're not just preaching abstinence there's actually things i can do <laughs> but it's like <laughs> it was ridiculous i was like it was completely culture shock and i didn't know any of that so it was like i was just completely brainwashed i guess in a way that this is normal and this is how it is and i was just like okay and rolled with it and then if that was senior year then like probably a lot of the other public school kids had been 
having this kind of curriculum for a while. So I'm guessing they were all like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. And you're and like, I remember, what? <laughs> yeah. And I remember actually, because um, I asked one of my teachers at Capitol, I was like, hey, is it okay to chew gum? Because I would get detention so much for chewing gum at Coal Valley. And I asked him if it was okay to chew gum. And he legit laughed at me and was like, why wouldn't you not be allowed to chew gum? And I was like, I, well, I, I, I'm just checking. I just have these weird experiences that make me feel like I'm best. <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool. We're, we're good. Yeah. It was, oh. yeah, it was insane. Were there other like th things that really struck you as like, this is different than Coal Valley, you know, public school is different. There wasn't, I noticed as many clicks hmm. at Capitol. Like I, I noticed that Coal Valley was very, very clickish. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I knew that people hung out with people and that friend and that people had their certain group of friends, but at Capitol, it wasn't like as ingrained like, yeah it wasn't like as ingrained like it wasn't as oh you can't you can't sit with us kind of thing it was and there wasn't a status so like hmm. at Cole Valley there was very much a hierarchy of the rich kids versus the not rich kids and at Capitol that wasn't a thing it was just oh you have money cool you don't have money cool but at Cole it was like that was one of the things I was most bullied over was the fact that I didn't have a lot of money mm. and that I couldn't afford high end things. And like, I remember one instance where I got hardcore bullied relentlessly because I bought my pants from a thrift store. And how did they know? I guess one of the girls saw me at the thrift store with my mom. And she was like, oh, and just like spread this huge thing around school that my pants were from a thrift store because I was telling everybody that they were from American Eagle because they had American Eagle tag on them. But she was like, no, they're not. They're from a thrift store. And just, Ugh. it was bad. And she's like, it must suck to have, like making fun of me about having a single mom and not having a lot of money and that I have to wear junk and just... Yeah, do you feel like that was cultural too? Or was that just like a few people acted that way? I think that that was, I think that a few people acted that way. I don't, certain, and it was certain girls that did it to me. And it was the same girls every year. So I dealt with these girls every single year from, yeah you know, elementary to high school, but it was just them. And they were very, very rich and had a ton of money. And wow. it was, if I, because I didn't, I got picked on and I just so they, I, I, begging my mom to let me have a job at 15 so that I could buy high end clothes so that I would stop getting picked on. Thanks. Did it happen to other people, other students you knew, or had less I never, economic? I never saw it, but that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Hmm. I never really, I mean, I never really saw it happen. And I think that if it, I was very much a doormat, and so I never really stood up for myself or, you know, never told them to go away or anything like that. And I think the other girls, did i think that they might have stepped up and been like i don't care what you think or leave me alone leave me alone or you know just something to that extent while i would just sit there and cry or be upset and kind of wow. giving them what they wanted and do you think that there was like this the teachers you know or administration mishandled like bullying cases or was this all like behind closed doors and like they couldn't have seen it or I no like they saw it I went to um my school counselor at the time and I told her what was going on and she literally was just like oh well girls will be girls and completely dismissed it and they're just like 
you need to just love them like God has called us to love them and you need to forgive them and all these things. And I'm just like, okay, I agree with you, but you're not going to do anything. Like they're making fun of me and <laughs> like, yeah, no, it's weird. It's like, do you think it's just like, they're not wanting to do a confrontation because their parents are rich or they actually don't really care about like, uh, people like they just don't really care about bullying. So they're like, if you feel bad, you know, like get over it or. Yeah. I, I don't know. I never, and I told her multiple times that it was going on and that it was happening. And I think that if I fought back, I would get in trouble because I would yell or I would scream at them or I would like clench my fists. I wasn't going to hit them, but it was like, I would just start getting so mad and they'd be like, that's not the way to handle that. It's like, I'm the only one coming to my own defense. I don't have anybody helping me or yeah. protecting me or. This almost seems like the victim blaming stuff. Like, you know, yeah. like that we heard about in sexual assaults. This is like a, you know, a different case of that. Like this kid's being picked on and feels like nobody's backing them up. So it's like need to kind of like do something and then like be like, no, you can't, you, you can't do anything. Yeah. Well, and it, I told my mom one day, I was like, I don't feel safe. I mean, nobody protects me. They don't come to my rescue. They don't defend me. I'm like, how am I supposed to feel safe here or feel important or respected or, right. You know, that's their job as teachers and staff to help me to feel good. And they're yeah. not doing that. And totally. No, it absolutely makes sense to me. Do you, did it feel like primarily like uh, your, you know, your mental and your um, self-esteem, like safety of, of those things? Or like, did you ever actually feel like your physical safety would be at risk? I never felt, I never worried about my physical safety, but just like mentally. Yeah, I no, the mental is huge. It's super. Yeah, important. I, I, mentally, I didn't feel like anybody was there or was willing to step in for me or help me in any way. And it was like, all this stuff is going on. You're witnessing this happen. I'm telling you firsthand accounts of this happening. And it's just, oh, we don't care, basically. And you need to forgive them and you need to love them like Jesus does. And I'm just like, great. Thanks. That, that resolves yeah. it. Yeah. You know, you were talking about the clicks. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if that's kind of like a cultural pattern too, because like whole Valley was very much like us and them, like, mm -hmm. like instilling this in like, us from an early age like there's the good people and the bad people the people the true followers and the not true followers like all these like black and white things and like clear distinctions do you, you think that had anything to do with the fact that like clicks thrived there because like there's always like you know there's our our group and we're the good good like we're the cool ones and then there's them yeah oh yeah that i think that played a huge part because there was always there was also like the super hardcore Christian kids and then the kind of have a relationship with Christ, but want to do their own thing kind of. And we were looked down on those kids. Because You're not like all encompassing zealots. No, we're not like Bible thumping, you know, <laughs> like, like every yeah, spare minute of my God. day, I need to be in <laughs> reading the Bible. Right. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I love God, like woot, but I also have a life and want to express myself and, and multiple interests in multiple interests and multiple friends. And, and I was the kind of person in school where I liked everybody and I got along with everybody. And unless you gave me a reason to not like you, I loved you. It, it was just, that's the kind of person that I was. So that's, what I did. And so I never fit into just one group. And I think that that made me a target for the bullying too, 
because I was friends with everybody. Hmm. And so they kind of tricked me into thinking that, oh, we like you. And then would yeah. pull it back and be like making fun of me and laughing. And yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah. We've talked in other um, interviews about how like Cole Valley kind of like has this perfect, like this box of like how a high school kid's supposed to be. They're supposed to be, you know, clean cut and, you know, middle class and, um, and, you know, very fervent and, um, you know, subscribe to the kind of gender hierarchies. Mm -hmm. Um, so you were like, kind of didn't fit in the box in like all categories. It's like you were, you didn't have your like in crowd, you, you know, had these trouble, like the trouble with the dress code or, or like, or just, you know, being yourself, but, um, <laughs> um wearing clothes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, like that, you know, was it, do you feel like you had enough like strikes against you that it was like easy for them to be like, okay, well, she's like too far gone. Like we don't really care anymore. Or, or is it, or was it that Cole Valley where like really one thing against you, you know, you'd be outcast or like isolated or was it like, you kind of had like, I don't know. I you know, certainly more than one. I experienced both with, like I, for me, it was a multitude of things, but I witnessed friends who would just do one thing and they were, they were out. And I was like, you dislike this person now because of this, or she's going through this because of this one thing. And it was like, and one of the girls in my class got pregnant. And I remember that being just she just became an outcast. Like nobody would talk to her. Nobody would let her sit with them at lunch. Nobody would. Cause it was just like, like completely. At one of the most vulnerable times of her, like, you know, you know, yeah. Yeah. confidence and everything. Yeah. And I remember going here because nothing stayed a secret at Coal Valley. You couldn't keep anything to yourself. Yeah. And so obviously I heard about it and I went, and sat with her at lunch, you know, just to talk to her and see how she was. Cause we were friends before all of this happened and I got in trouble for talking to her. What? How'd I, that happen? I, I talked to her and I guess somebody went and told one of the higher ups that I was talking to her and I got pulled in and they were like, you shouldn't be friends with this person. She's a bad influence. All of this is happening. It, we don't want it to rub off on you. And I'm just like, me being friends with this person isn't going to influence my life decisions for one thing. Second of all, everybody has completely isolated her. It, I, like I, this is insanity. And it was just, it was crazy. <laughs> they were like, no, we're, we're, We've banned that person. That person's blacklisted. No one can yeah. talk to them. Nobody can talk, talk about a pro-bullying stance. Right? And this was coming from administration. So this wasn't coming from other classmates. This was coming from administration. That because I talked to this person, I was... Now I'm at risk of going and having sex and getting pregnant. Right. I talked to her. And I was like... This is absolutely ridiculous. Like, I, I can't. <laughs> yeah. No, they're always like, you know, we're cry like, we are Christ focused education. We're just like Christ. We love everybody. But it seems like actually you were um, treated badly because you were the like one of the few people that was like, was trying to love everybody. Yeah. And it was, and I know the boy that did it and nothing happened with him. And that was, I think, even more mind blowing. Was that? Did everybody know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It wasn't a secret. It wasn't a, you know. But he was chilling and doing his thing like he always did, and just hanging out and not having a care in the world. And everybody talked to him, but because she had the proof under her shirt, it was her fault and her choice, and therefore she was. 
Yeah, this is like the thing with this dress code. And I mean, the dress code is like a symptom of the, the worldview, which is like women are less. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's boys can do no wrong. And it's, it's totally the girl's responsibility to prevent the guys from doing, you know, doing what they can't control. It's all natural. It's instinctual that yeah. they can't help themselves. And like you don't have any sexual desires. That's not okay. And actually your focus needs to be their sexual desires and like minimizing them because yeah. that's what you control. Yeah. So I, I can control not tempting them. Exactly. And it's just like, okay. Have you watched um, Handmaid's Tale? No. Have you heard of it? I have heard of it, yeah. Oh, man. You should watch it. Um, yeah. The, it's like, a, you, know, you know, the storyline, basically, like this dystopian. Yeah. This dystopian new future, if anybody, you know, is watching that doesn't know, where basically a ultra conservative government takes control with a coup and they create this society that is basically taking biblical, um, so, you know, not, you know, not what a lot of people would call biblical, but like this version of, you know, the hyper conservative literal interpretation of the Bible and making a society of, over it. And it's like women are slaves. Um, and it's horrifying but it's actually like from my coal valley background it's like it's only feels like a few like you know levels past coal valley it's like if everybody believed coal valley um if that was the norm then there would be people on each side like this stuff would be happening all like you know maybe oh, yeah. not instituted by the government fully but like there would be a lot more people subjugating women on the on the fringes and it was like, yeah, I can see how like the way I was raised could lead to that. Like it's yeah. not so far gone, so far removed. Yeah. It was it's freaky. Yeah. I my mom watched it and she loved it. She keeps telling me to watch it. So maybe that'll be my next Maybe I can push you over the edge. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so that was, those are big, those were big ones, like the gender dynamics, the um, dress code and the clicks. Um, were there any other things that really stuck out to you? There was like a peculiar year now or conspicuous that maybe didn't, you didn't, didn't raise enough red flags for it to kind of get you consciously then, but looking back. There was, so when I was either seven or eight, I was diagnosed with ADD. So totally, perfectly common. Everybody usually gets diagnosed with it. And my biggest struggle in school was math. And that was really the only struggle that I had academically was math. And to this day, I still very much have a hard time with math. But I feel like the second I got that diagnosis, I was getting extra help in reading. I was getting extra help in writing. I was getting extra help in art. I was getting extra help in all of these subjects. And I was like, I don't, even at, even at nine, I was like, I don't need this. I need help with math. Like I'm good with the English and I'm good with the grammar and I'm good with all this stuff. But I think because that was put on me, it was, and it went all the way into high school. They wouldn't let me take a honors English, which I had applied for. And I was like, okay, whatever. It's cool. But then when I started my freshman year, they had put me in an English class, which was basically like introduction English and introduction grammar. And when I asked why they did this, they were just like, oh, well, we just know you need the extra help. And I was like, I don't need the extra help with this though. Like I, and it, it was like, 
from the moment I got diagnosed until then, it was like, I'm stupid and I can't do it was basically the mindset that that put me in was that I'm not smart enough for this. And yeah, that's weird. Do you think it was like, do you think they were, that was like a conscious, some sort of thing, or it was just like some sort of incompetence. Like they didn't really know what they were doing. I think it was probably just, incompetence and ignorance i don't think that it was not they don't know what this means how this applies to like the the learning and the developmental like situation so they're like just kind of doing things inconsistently and like not applying best practices or It, it was it was i told i went home because me and my mom were told i couldn't do ap english so we both were just like okay we accepted it. It was fine. It was no big deal. I was going to be put in my, in the regular ninth grade English class with the rest of my peers. That's what we had gotten. That's what we had received. That's what we had been told. So we were like, okay, freshman year, first day, I was in this tiny class with like three, three other people. Most of them, or maybe like 10 other people, but they were seventh graders, most of them. And I went home and told my mom about it. And my mom was like, what? And I was like, yeah, this, this is totally happening. And she called the school and called, talked to Mr. Carr about it. And it's just, he was, I don't know exactly what was said, but he was just like, oh yeah, we just know that she needs the extra help. And we know that, you know, she, she struggles academically and all of these things. And my mom was just like, no, that's not, it's like we were told that she was going to be placed in regular English and I wasn't. And it was like, it was labels like that. That was just so ADD makes me stupid and they perceive me as stupid. Do you think they, that's like a, like a position that's like grounded in a culture of like righteousness? Like we, we know what's best for people. So like, this is our position. Therefore, like, we're not, we like, we're right. Like you can, you might think whatever, but like, we're right. So this is what we're going to do. I, I, I think it stems from that. I think that some of it has to do with that, but I think a lot of it was just, they didn't know what they were doing. They, I think it was, they were trying to do what they thought was best, but it, it they just was, didn't know what they were like, you know, they didn't know what they were dealing with really or being kind of arbitrary yeah it it was just I was like in trying to make me feel better and give me good education you're making me feel stupid and less than and it was and when I got put what and I knew that this was really wrong when I got put into capital and I was in all AP classes and I was like, and I didn't even have to fight. I was like, I really want to take AP English. And she's like, okay. And I was like, you're going to just let me take AP? And she's like, well, yeah. And I was like, okay. And she's like, you want to do AP history too? I see your history grades have been really good. And I'm like, yeah, okay. It, it was just, I was like, so I'm not stupid and I can do this. It, so why didn't I get that at Cole? Where... You would think that I should be getting encouraged more as opposed to a public school where I actually got a better education. It, right. it, was, it was ridiculous. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So what did, did that really stand out to your mom too? Like that kind of, yeah, I can yeah. imagine. Yeah, that to this day, that's one of the things she still talks about that she regrets most about having me there was that that was happening. And even basically being held back in your courses. Yeah. And she said, she's like, this was to me, she was like, I thought that she, she trusted the teachers. She was like, I was so, she was brainwashed just like me. She's like, I trusted the teachers that they thought, that they were doing what was best and she didn't question it because Mm. she trusted them. And so even though it was a little weird and a little bit of a red flag, she was just like, well, they know what they're doing. And 
they love you and they want what's best for you. So we should just roll with it. Right. Hmm. And it was, so the parents were dealing with it too, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of part of this whole culture ethos of like unassailable authority. Like, Mm -hmm. um, where if you, you know, any kind of dissent or disagreement or arguments are kind of like, well, what are you doing? You're not like falling in line. I feel like that's kind of why this whole thing is blown up so much. It's because it's like, for the first time in a way that they can't really control, there's a, you know, a very thorough accounting of criticisms and like, they've been really successful at like pushing criticisms, like down, quieting them and like, you know, getting rid of them. Yeah. Um, I think it's easy to fall into that, like accepting the authority when like, that's basically like what's required of you in every aspect of everything. Yeah. And it was like, I mean, some of my favorite people were like, I loved the nurse, the school nurse. And she was one of the few people who would, that I went to the school nurse of all people that I went to about the bullying. And she was like, this isn't okay. They shouldn't be treating you like this. She would give me other explanations of how to deal with it or Mm. different ways of handling it. And I'm like, this should be what my counselor is saying, not what my school nurse is saying, but. What, uh, do you think the school nurse, like, was this like closet disagreement? Like, did she know that, you know, there was an official position from the administration and it was basically like, you know, just deal with it. Like, don't let it bother you. And then she is just like, but actually like, that's terrible. Like, I'm not going to like speak up or like, you know, argue with them, but like, but you shouldn't accept that. Yeah. I, I, I think that she was very much like wink, wink kind of thing. Like I agree with them but I don't agree with them kind of like this isn't okay. I mean, it's great, but it was like, yeah. she, she would say, she's like, obviously you have a lot of the time she would say, obviously you have to do what you're told and you have to do what standards say, but at the same time, this shouldn't be happening and you need to take a stand or you need to, you know, tell them to leave you alone or things like that. So it was a lot of the times she would say, you have to do what what you're told to do but don't do what you're told (laughs) kind of thing interesting that yeah that position um i wonder if that person's in the support group now do you know i don't think so okay um because you'd wonder if like this teacher knows that the some of this has has awareness that at least some things are messed up yeah basically like going against the system from within you'd wonder if like they would eventually crack and like you know eventually like be like you know i can't do this anymore this is messed up or if like you know they could just keep doing that forever you know well i know the year after i graduated she left Hmm. so i don't know if it was just based on certain things yeah or yeah i know that one of my favorite teachers is in the support group and Mm. she actually came when I had told my story, she actually came and said that she was, she messaged and said that she was sorry and that she didn't realize what was going on and what was happening and that she was clouded at Cole. And I told her, I was like, you were my favorite teacher. Like you were the one place that I could go where I felt safe and where I felt like I could be myself and where I felt like I could do me and not be judged by it. I could take my big baggy shirts off in your class. I could, Mm. my bullies weren't in that class. And so it was for an hour, I got sanctuary basically. Yeah. Man, that's a powerful interaction that like, you know, this teacher saw your post and want, you know, felt the need to, you know, apologize all these years later that like how much they care that you know all the time that's passed they're still like 
care and you know realize like how how much how bad that was to the point that they want to join a support group and you know do individual messages with past students yeah what did what did it feel like to post on the support group it was I was a little bit afraid at first and a lot of the things like a lot of the replies that I got was oh I had no idea this was happening to you and a lot of the responses are that and I said I didn't really talk about it I didn't you know I didn't really bring it up I didn't yeah. really discuss it it I none of this was really happening so on the outside I was all smiles and you know loving everybody but this was what was really going on and it felt almost freeing to be able to put my story out there mm -hmm. and to be able to share it and say this is what was really happening that you didn't see and it was like oh the huge weight was just off yeah. when I shared it I was like I was just honest and it felt amazing and now people know what I really went through. Yeah. Yeah. Have many other people messaged you privately? Like any comments? Because uh, I've heard other people have had that, have, you know, somebody would reach out and they'd talk. And mm -hmm. Yeah. One other person was just like, she said, she said, I wish you would have talked to me and I wish you would have told me what was happening. And, you know, we, we were friends and I wish that I, that you would have just been that you would have just talked to me and it was a lot of just I'm a very personal inside person and I deal with it by myself and so well, it was like you know it's not <laughs> comfortable thing when you're going through something really hard it might not be just easy to like you know talk about it and you're a little kid like yeah. I feel like that's that's some of the way the administration has reacted to some of these stories and these claims. It's like, well, they should have just said something. Yeah. But it's like, you're trying to make these kids that are like going through incredible anxiety and stress and challenges and some, and many trauma. And it's like, yeah, no, the onus is on you to like fix this. If there's a problem, like, well, and a lot of us did is the thing like a lot of us did go to administration and tell them what was going on and a lot of the time we were treated the same way oh well you know just yeah, pray so it's your it. problem. just like change the way you don't let that bother you or yeah don't let it bother you just change your mindset and it's like this isn't what we need right now what we need is for you to come to our rescue and to defend us and like yay god and everything but it's still we're human, we're right here, and this is what's going on in our lives. And you're basically telling us that it doesn't matter. Well, and that, and they control the culture and they're choosing not to not to do anything about it. They're like, you're you're just a special case. Yeah. You don't care about special cases. Yeah. And yeah. It, it it's just yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um do you have any other things that you've been, you won't really want to touch on before the last two questions that I always ask? Um, I think that honestly, that was, we always make jokes about the sex education. Even that was one thing that my friends and I still laugh about is the kind of sex education that we received, which was, I guess not really sex education. It was more of like abstinence education. Like abstinence that was propaganda. Yeah. Yeah. Ab abstinence propaganda. And like literally I, and I still like, I talked to my friends and they're like, I knew nothing. Like when I got married or when I got into this relationship, they're like, I knew nothing. And I was just like, yeah, I, pff, I knew nothing. It was like, I, it was, I didn't know how this worked. I didn't know you know how any of it went together I didn't I didn't know anything and it was it was crazy and I was like the only I got more of a sex education from my mom than I did from my school mm -hmm. and it was like it's so weird that like I mean this is this was totally normal and not weird to me in the past but like so weird now to think that people get married and don't know how anything works 
isn't that crazy like uh like how weird how awkward is that whole interaction yeah you know, <laughs> first six months of your marriage where you're like i don't know was that normal i know is, is that okay <laughs> yeah huh? yeah I, yeah it was it was insanity yeah um <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So the last two are, um, is there anything that you want the administration to hear? Like, is there a message to them that you have? And then the second one is, do you have a message um, or is there something you want prospective parents that are thinking about putting their kids in Coal Valley to, to hear or think about? Um, as far as administration, I would want them to know in what, in thinking what they're doing is best is really not what's best. Them trying to preach Christianity and love and tolerance, they're doing the exact opposite of all of those things by making us feel like that or by ignoring us or pushing us to the back burner. And I want them to realize that, you know, I'm, boys have just as much of a choice in things as girls do. And that guys need to be held responsible as much as girls do. They can think, they have minds, they can control what is done. And then as far as parents go, the biggest thing I would say is, listen to your kids and keep an open mind. It's don't think that just because it's a Christian school that there's not problems with the organization or there's not problems with the, the school in and of itself. Just, you know, honestly listen to your kids and listen to their complaints and don't just, I mean, if you want to put them there, that's great, but really l- listen to them with what they have to say which is ultimately what my mom did was she finally took away the clouded judgment and said, this is not healthy. This is not okay. This should not be happening. We're done. And ended it right there. So, and she said, if I would have done that a long time ago, you would have been out of there a long time ago. So really honestly, just listen and know what's going on and Mm -hmm. That's what I would tell prospective parents. Yeah. Yeah. And have an open mind. How, was that part of the same thing? Like open mind that maybe the administration doesn't have a good view on this or they're not yeah. doing the right thing. Yeah. Have an open mind to what's happening and don't just, it's a Christian school done. This is, this is how it is. It's a Christian school. They're receiving the best education the teachers are right. Yeah. Like open up your mind and realize it, there could be issues or there could be problems and that the administration isn't perfect. Yep. Right. Wow. That, that was a, that was a good interview. We covered a lot of good ground. So thank you very much um, yeah. for making the time. Um, yeah, I, thanks again for being a part of the support group and, and keep on uh, contributing because it helps a ton to lots of people. Yes, thank you for everything you've been doing. I really appreciate it. <laughs> oh, thanks. Well, anyway, talk to you later. Have a good night. Right. Bye. You too, bye.